This broadcast is always about stories. It's about conversations. It's about meeting people. It's about sort of seeing the world through the eyes of somebody else. I have a special guest. Her name is Erin. She and I are both drinking our coffee, ready for a conversation. Hi, Erin. Hi. So I have to start with your Twitter handle, which is one of the reasons we're speaking. It's Red X Christian, or it's we say X Christian. How do you spell it? What is that? Um, it's just I wrote X, and then I kind of, I guess, to be a little cheeky, um, keep the Christ in Christmas, but I took the X and used it in my Twitter handle. So it's X X Ten X Christian Aaron. E X X T I A N Aaron. Christ Christian Aaron. The reason we're talking is because you are a recent. Do I call you an escapee? Well, what's the word you like? Um, yeah, escapee works. Um, I kind of faded out, I, w- I would say. <laughs> um, de- deconstruction, uh, deconversion. Um, I'm, yeah, I just, I'm an ex-Christian now. From what? What kind of Christianity? So I, I was raised uh, Pentecostal. So the the crazy ones. <laughs> um, my parents were a divorce, so I actually kind of grew up going to a Pentecostal church and a, a Baptist church. And so there was already a lot of conflict there for me growing up. Um, but my mom's church was the Pentecostal church, and that's ultimately the theology, I guess, that stuck. So I continued on with the Pentecostal faith for quite a long time. Um, the last 10 years or so that I was in it, I went to a non-denominational church, but it was still fairly... Um, it was a little calmer. It was less charismatic, less uh, people falling on the floor and wailing, but it was, it was still fairly charismatic, like char- fairly um, lively. The assembly of God is sort of Pentecostal light. Like they don't yeah. Yeah. put a huge emphasis on jumping the pew, speaking in tongues, although it does happen occasionally. It's, but it's definitely more of an emotional experience. It's expressive in that way, the assemblies of God or the non-denominational. Yeah. yeah, the non-denominational church I went to had like a really, they were really into the music. So I think that's part of what drew us there. Um, my husband's a musician. He he actually used to be a worship leader. Um, so the church we had gone to, they said a fantastic, like it was just very, it was a great place to go on Sundays. It, the kids loved it. The music was great. Um, and it was a little less, uh, it was a bit more of a seeker, seeker sensitive church, I guess. So Seeker sensitive for those who are curious is when they don't preach like hellfire and brimstone. They're not trying to give you all the rules. It's really more of kind of a Joel Osteen experience, right? You are somebody and you can do it and have faith in yourself and we're here for you and rah, rah, go team. Seeker friendly, meaning it's not going to beat you over the head with something that might scare you off. If you're a seeker, we want to bring you in, make you feel validated, empowered, safe, all those things. Did I get that right, you think, Aaron? Yeah, a lot of motivational kind of talking instead. Um, they even, at the last church I went to, they, they had um, a pretty good emphasis on like mental health care and that sort of, like they, they're getting there. There are a lot of humanistic values, but then they throw in the, the love of Jesus in every message as well. So, so how, I mean, you're freshly out of the faith. Mm-hmm. How soon are we talking? How long ago? I just I just had kind of my one year um, moment, one year anniversary, but I, I, I didn't realize I was deconverting when I started. <laughs> um, everything kind of started falling apart for me last May. And then I think it was about August, September is when I, I, I kind of looked myself in the mirror and I, I was like, I, I don't believe any of this. I would normally not sort of grab onto somebody who is so freshly out of the faith. Like you need time to center. Normally when you come out, you look around and you see the world and you sort of have to rediscover yourself, your value system and all those things. I'm sure that's the case for you, but you're pretty centered on Twitter. When I see you posting, you're asking relevant questions. You have a perspective, I think, that is greater than the, you know, 12 months or whatever out of the faith. Makes me think your journey was probably a longer journey, probably in the order of years, right? Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think it officially started a year ago, but I, I, when I look back now, it started 15 years ago, started a long time ago. 
we could be siblings, right? Because I had one conservative parent and I had a Pentecostal parent and we sort of got the flavor of both bouncing back and forth. Of course, I leaned more conservative. I related more to the Baptists. I didn't like or buy speaking in tongues. Mom would always say, oh, it's, it's real. You know, it's valid. It happens. It happens. And whenever I'd hear somebody start wailing out in church, it used to just freak me out. Did you have an experience with speaking in tongues? Yeah, I can still do it. <laughs> oh, you used yeah. to speak in tongues personally? Yeah, and I and, uh, found my journals even from the day that it started. Um, yeah, I, I used to speak in tongues. I still can, which is interesting. I, I, my, my church was that. It was a, the, the Pentecostal church anyway. It was speaking in tongues was your evidence that you're truly saved. So it was really, really heavy, heavily emphasized at my church. So I yeah. won't ask you to do it. Like I don't want you. To do it. I couldn't. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to ask you to do it. But can you tell me where that comes from? Is it is it something that you are taught, or were you just sort of vamping it? I mean, um, it is kind of interesting looking back because they 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 push. It's a lot of. It's like the environment is like it's very intense. The the altar calls and the music and everyone around you is doing it, and they kind of. Um, they kind of give you this walkthrough on like how to start. They're like, okay, like they're praying. They say like, open your mouth and just like, just start letting some, you know, they say, let some worship come out and just let your, like, and it's kind of at first you, um, it's just, you think you're doing something, but it's something so, it feels supernatural at the time. <laughs> I, I really did. I, I remember believing it was, it was very special at the time, but when I, um, when I really think about it, I was kind of just imitating the sounds I was hearing next to me. And I think it kind of just goes back like all the way down the line. Like uh, my tongue sounds just like my mom's. So that I've been hearing it my whole life. Um, and so when I, when I did it, I, I was really just kind of imitating her. Um, and I noticed that uh, like a lot of people who kind of ran in the same circles, their, their gift of speaking in tongues kind of all sounded the same. It was like a dialect. <laughs> And then I would go visit an, a different church and their, their tongues kind of all sounded very similar. And I remember noticing that um, early on. Interesting. Um, I've always had this theory that those churches attract personality types that fit. Like the Baptist church attracted conservative people who were conservative in personality, right? They didn't want to jump the pews. They didn't want to dance. They didn't want to run around with the flags and the ribbons and you know, personally, they just weren't comfortable. So they were attracted to the Baptist faith or the Methodist or the Lutherans. Do you feel like the Pentecostals, the Assemblies of God, the non-denominationals, feel like that they attracted a more emotional flavor of person? Oh, I do. I do yeah. And I, when I think about my own, my mom's like move into Pentecostal, when she talks about it, she grew up like more Presbyterian, very conservative. And then she found the Pentecostal movement um, in her uh, mid twenties. So um, it's, it's, it's all very, very emotional, very experiential for her. Um, and then for myself, I, I struggled with it in, in there. Cause I, I, I'm a little bit of an introvert. I, I don't really like embarrassing myself. <laughs> so that time growing up in there, there was a lot of pressure to do that. And I remember myself feeling like uh, it doesn't feel right. It feels very awkward for me. So even as soon as I, I left my parents' home, I, I was also drawn to like a little bit calmer of a church environment. Um, yeah, I definitely think it, it, draws, it draws, it attracts people according to their personality. <laughs> Let's talk about your story, which is the reason we're sort of connecting in this way today. You walked the aisle, knelt at the altar, you saved at home, something else. So how did you have the Jesus experience the first time? I, <laughs> some alarms going off. That's, that's Satan. That's <laughs> Satan. The, the devil doesn't want us to have this conversation. This is what a pastor would do in church. The yeah. devil doesn't like it when you step on his toes and he'll try to distract you. But we're um, going to overcome. So apparently I said the sinner's prayer when I was four. I don't really remember it, but I, apparently, I have a vague, vague memory of it. Um, and I said it uh, at home with my mom right before I went to bed. That's the story, as the story goes. Um, I probably had my first, like... Jesus experience at kids camp when I was eight. Um, I started going to those 
Jesus Camp, <laughs> really, like the movie. Have you seen the movie? I've seen Jesus Camp. It was yeah. Yeah, terrifying was and tragic and enraging. And when you saw it, you must have just been, I mean, wow. When I saw it, I, I, I was breathless. I just I couldn't believe it. I, it was a lot like that, um, a little less um, the emphasis on, it was a little less strict than that. Like it was more of a, you know, free yourself and be free you know, in the spirits. And so, but there was a lot, there was still a lot of pressure to engage in a very like raw, raw kind of way. Um, so that was my first kind of personal kind of feeling like, oh yeah, I'm really, this is real. Um, so I came home from that summer camp and I, I think I, I wrote it down because I can't remember. Um, I was baptized at nine at, at my home church and I continued on like going, camp was my life. I, all year long, I did go to a public school, um, but all year long, all I could think about was camp in the summertime. And I spent most of my summers at camp. I, I went to at least two or three different camps every summer. Um, as first as a camper and then starting quite young, I was a junior counselor and then I was a, I was a full counselor and then like a head, head counselor at my camp. And I, I spent my whole summer there by the time I was in high school. I want to go back to your four year old conversion experience. You know, I think uh, I remember being at a church and seeing them cart out these young kids, right? Because they had supposedly reached the age of accountability, right? This is the point when you are able to understand that you are a sinner understand that Christ died for your sins, and you understand the implications of saying the salvation prayer. You've reached the age of accountability. And of course, I'm thinking, how much do you really know about anything at four, right? At four. So you must look at your four-year-old conversion experience with uh, some, I mean, you tell me, what are the emotions, what are the thoughts and feelings that come to your mind when you think about, hey, you know, they sort of pounded this into this kid before you even really understood anything about the world? Um, as, a, as a mom now, and I have two kids, and one of them is turning four this summer, um, I look back on it, and I, I, it's horrible. I, I really, I look, I couldn't imagine... Um, Teaching my, teaching my youngest, my son, who's four, um, that there is such a thing as hell. Because I, I really, it was a lot to do with, like, the fear of being separated from my family as a, as a, as a kid. Like, that's the, the worst feeling is to, you know, get lost in a mall. How much worse would it be forever? <laughs> so, um, I, the message itself is really, really toxic. <laughs> and then the pressure to go ahead and do the, the sinner's prayer and, acknowledging that I needed to do that if I didn't want to get separated from my family, that, that makes me really sad. And, um, yeah, it's, it's not a good feeling that comes over me when I think about it. I mentioned something about Christian school, mm -hmm. some of my experiences, and you jumped right into the thread. Hello. You had your hand in the air, been there, done that. What about Christian school for you? We didn't have a Christian school. I mean, my, I grew up in a fairly small town. Um, so I went to a public school, but it was supplemented. <laughs> lots of lots of after school programs. I did Awanas, uh, the Bible memorization thing for years. Um, just tons of after school programs. We were at the church probably three or four times a week. My parents were involved in the church. My dad was a deacon. Um, so they, I, I just say uh, they supplemented. <laughs> they, they tried to sneak it in every every other way, um, but I didn't actually go to a Pentecostal or a Sorry, yeah. <laughs> a yeah, a private, private religious school. Yeah. yeah. But they did that through the church. They had you in kind of a classroom, be it a Sunday school, vacation, Bible school kind of environment. Then. Oh, yeah. What are we talking about? We talking about like a young earth kind of thing, Adam and Eve literally in the garden with the snake. Yeah. I, yeah, my, my church was a young, a young earth creationist church. My parents still are. Um, they, I think it was probably less rigorous because it was just like Sunday school and it was, it was taught more just through the Bible stories, but yeah, we got, we got taught maybe not um, like younger science kind of creation stuff, but the Bible stories like from very early on and, and uh, it was a lot, it was everywhere constantly. And yeah. all my books that I read at home were all Bible based books, um, children's Bible, all of that. I still have my children's Bible. It's, 
plenty of pictures, happy, yeah. happy things going on. Yeah, it's beautiful, the flood story. <laughs> right, the flood is such a beautiful story with the rainbow and the animals and the dove yeah. and the olive branch. and yeah. Coloring books with Noah's Ark and Adam and Eve and coloring in leaves on, you know, it, that, that, that all felt very normal to me. Um, yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, you start to see that it's not adding up. I'm not really sure where to start the question. You tell me. You've got doubts, questions? Well, I think my doubts really started when I was in, like, junior high school and high school because I, I do love, I love learning, I love reading, I love science class, I love biology. That was one of my favorite subjects. Um, so I, I had this... Uh, I kind of lived in this weird world where I, at school, I like, I really loved that stuff. I got good grades on it. I found it really interesting, but I couldn't talk about that at home. It was like a major no-no, like I, it, evolution's evil. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of, I kind of lived a double life in a way because I, I, I had my church and I, I spoke my Christianese kind of <laughs> lingo at the church. And then I'd, I'd go to school and I was, I was known to be a Christian, but I also was really involved in classes because I really, I liked, uh, I liked what we were learning. It was really interesting, but I just kind of kept those two things separate in my mind for a long, long time. Mm. Yeah. Did you feel like your culture sort of uh, pushed you into a biblical womanhood? You know, the good wife finds a man, gets married young, relatively young. And, you know, you have children because you're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Pentecostals are big on that. Was it true with you? A hundred percent. Yeah. I, um, my, my church, well, my youth, my years as a teenager, that was like the peak of period, purity culture. Uh, it was, and that's probably why I, I that's probably why I speak out a lot on my Twitter is how damaging that was for me. I, I had the purity ring. I made the purity pledges. I didn't go to any. All right, hang on. I'm going to interrupt you. Okay. You're going to have to, for those who are looking at us like we're from another planet, when you say yeah. purity ring and purity pledge, they're like, well, what's that? So explain it for those who don't know what it is, if you would. I have it, right. I have it with me. I you have your purity I ring? I do. Yeah. Okay. Walk us through it. Paint the picture with the purity ring and the ceremony. There was no ceremony with mine. Okay. Because it was just something that my parents gave me, um, but it was it was coming from all the teachings at church that uh, like to make a commitment with your parents. Um, a lot of them pushed it like the, more with your dad, but it, for me it was with both my parents. Uh, make a commitment to them that you'll remain pure, aka you won't have sex, you won't. Um, you know, you won't get involved in that way. Yeah. You won't have lustful thoughts. You won't, you won't break your, your promise to God and desecrate the temple kind of a thing. Yeah. I get so you. I, my parents got me a ring and my ring has my birthstone and then my parents birthstones on either side of it. And so this was my commitment that I made to my parents that I would not have sex until I got married. And I wore this up until I got married at 20. And that's when I, yeah, uh, exchanged the rings with my husband because now I was giving my body to him now. It's, it's gross now when I think of it. It's, it's disturbing. <laughs> you share only as much as you want. Okay? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, 20s, I mean, you're, I, still, you're still finding yourself, right? I mean, you're still looking around at the world. Bam, you're thrust into this relationship. You may not even know the guy very well. I mean, you tell me, was it... Yeah. Was it like that? Very much so. I, I had just moved to BC, like on the West Coast. I had come out of one year of Bible college. I was in a state I, where I, I felt very vulnerable because I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing with my life. And I met a guy and through the church, and, and we had been, we kind of had started dating over the summertime, and we had dated about three months. And everybody, that was just, the pressure was enormous. And I, I was not in my own environment. I was new to this church. And so it was, I, there was not a lot of room for me to make a decision. I felt like I looked back and I'm like, I, I didn't see any way for it to not just keep, I got on this train and I just couldn't get off this train. So um, we were engaged by Christmas time. And at this point I've only known him for about eight months. And then we, we got married and we were engaged when I was 19. And we got married right, right when I was turned 20. And I, when we, I didn't know him. I didn't know, hard, I didn't know him at all. 
it was horrible. We were together for three years um, to do with the purity culture thing. Like because of all those things that I was taught, uh, there was nothing going on with us beforehand. And so when we got married, it was, it was quite shocking for me. Um, all the stuff I've been told about my, uh, the promises that God would keep to like, if you keep your, your promise, your purity, your value, your worth, all of that, then he'll bless you with this amazing marriage. So I, I kind of went into this, this marriage thinking like, you know, I, I feel a little unnerved by all this, but I'm just going to give all my trust, all my, everything to God. And he seems to be leading me down this path that this guy, and you know, right now and all of this. And, and it was just very shocking to me when things just went horribly. <laughs> um, we were together for three years and it was just, it was, it was such a struggle. We didn't have a connection. We didn't actually see eye to eye on hardly anything. Um, and we were just kids. We were just really immature. <laughs> Did you so, submit to him as the head, the male head of the house? I think there was less of that sub- submission mentality. Um, as, as much as there was like, he was my spiritual leader. So I was still, I had my opinions and I did my own thing and I, I was working at the time. I was helping put him through the rest of, he was going to Bible college as well. So I was working, supporting him going through school. So that's a little unconventional, but um, for, for the Christian community. But um, when it came to spiritual things, uh, decision-making and, and that kind of thing, it was always, it was, I was taught and it was supposed to be him who led us. So there was a lot of things that just kept going sideways and, and I, I looked to him to fix everything because I was taught that that was what marriage was about. Like, and I think that might've been part of why I married him. Cause I felt, I felt very chaotic. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. And I was like, you know, getting married will help stabilize that. It'll help ground me because I need a spiritual leader because I'm a woman and I can't really lead myself. So that's kind of where the damaging submission stuff comes in. I'm talking to uh, Aaron, who is a recent, we'll call you a recent deconvert. You know, it's funny, we should do another show, I think, on purity culture yeah, I'd because love to. of how insidious it is. I mean, last time we did a broadcast years and years ago that talked about this, it was story after story of these poor young women who went in. They either, if they weren't virgins, were racked with guilt because they had messed everything up and they were impure and And if they were virgins, they went into the honeymoon completely unprepared for intimacy. And it just, it was traumatizing for a great many of them. And they, you know, you don't get to really discover if you are compatible physically and in that specific way, which is a huge component of relationships. It's funny, Aaron, maybe you're the same way because now whenever I'm on this side of the looking glass and I see a couple that's dating a young couple, I'm always like, you know what, live together. Like live in the same space and see if it works before you sign any document anywhere. I don't know. Did that happen to you? Oh my God. Yes. I, I mean, I'm not asking about the honeymoon. I'm asking about, did you have that sort of sea change in your attitudes about intimacy? Yeah, definitely. I, so I, (laughs) it was horrible that just moving in, everything's we're supposed to be married now with, with him. It was, we weren't compatible. Um, just everything was such a struggle. And then when I got out of that relationship, so I left, I left him eventually because I just had had enough. It didn't last very long. It was three years. Um, but yeah, definitely. I, um, I am married again now with my husband and we definitely lived together for a year and a half or almost two years before we got engaged. And I definitely recommend it because we, we actually got to see how compatible we are. And, we, and we've been together for almost a decade now. So. How, how did Young Earth Creationist Fundamentalist Christians, Assemblies of God, non-denation, non-denominational mom and dad feel about this whole cohabitation thing? Were they, were they giving you the raised eyebrow? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. I, when I told them that I was moving in with my husband, it was very, it was, well, we love, we love you, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> they always start with it. Don't they? <laughs> we love you so much. Yeah. Nothing we, would ever make us not love you, but, and then but, they go off. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then for a, a while there, if anything was like not quite right, um, if like my, my car broke down or something and they'd be like, well, you know, 
you have to, <laughs> they had this kind of weird way of um, justifying anything that kind of went wrong with me being disobedient to God. And I was, I was still a Christian, a Christian during this, but I, I was so, so it was difficult. There was, it was an easy way to blame anything that was going wrong in my life <laughs> because I was living in sin. Did you have any honest conversations with mom and dad about your doubts when you were an adult? I did. Um, kind of right when I was leaving my, my first husband, I, I expressed to my mom how I, like the promises didn't come true. And I felt I had to kind of express this feeling of feeling betrayed by God because I had done all the things and I, I was expecting something to go a little smoother, but not, not like that. And so I had expressed my doubts first uh, with God's promises maybe. And with these, um, sacrifices and reward kind of messages that we would get at church. So like the prosperity um, gospels, and I think it stretches to like the sexual prosperity as well. Um, but I did, I did kind of start going down that line of my doubts and um, I'm just like, I just, I'm just not really sure what I believe anymore. I think I said to her and at that point I really was just questioning the dom- denominations and theology, but um, she, she really, took it hard. She broke down, started crying. Um, and there was a couple of things that's, that I, I think back to now, which really just swung me back right, right back into it. It was her, her, her grief over the thought of me not being in heaven with her. Um, if I, if I did lose my faith and then she had told me, I, I know you believe you do believe because, um, whenever you're struggling, you always ask me to pray for you. And, and so, and that kind of was like, okay, well, every time, if I'm still wanting my mom to pray for me when something's going wrong, I must be truly, I truly believe it. And it wasn't until this last year that I realized that that's, it could, it's just more of a conditioning thing. Of course I want my mom to pray for me because that's what has always happened when I'm upset. I call my mom, something's going wrong. She says, I'll pray for you. And so it became a soothing thing for me. So letting go of that was um, a big step for me and realizing that that, that doesn't, that's not a, evidence of belief that's evidence of conditioning Aaron why push through that what drove you to keep kicking the tires to see if it was real or not <laughs> I it's a really good question I, I was sick of the mental strain that I was experiencing I I I couldn't reconcile these things. I couldn't reconcile how I saw people, how I saw the world. I couldn't reconcile um, these empty promises that were always, always not being fulfilled to the church. And, and I, I think there was just a moment where I thought like, this might not be all, this might not be real. And if it's not real, that that's, I can stop, I can stop feeling so um, burdened down by this all because none of it makes sense. Cause I knew something didn't make sense. And in my search to try to figure out what was the right version of Christianity, what was correct theology. Um, I kind of just saw this, this moment where I was like, if it's not true, then all of this is just wasted energy. So I kept going. I kept going. I just kept, kept reading, kept learning. Um, I don't think I ever sought out to figure out if it was wrong. I was just trying to figure out what was, I had heard this before from a lot of people. I was trying to figure out what was right. Mm. And, and I it just, <laughs> one question would come up with another question and another question. And it, and I I've read and heard this from other people. It's just, it's just completely overwhelming. It overwhelmed my mind for a good six months or more. I couldn't read enough. I couldn't get enough answers. And I just wanted to, I just wanted things to make sense. And I couldn't make sense still as a, still in the faith because it doesn't make sense. I feel bonded to you. Like, I feel like <laughs> you've been looking in my windows. It's just such a familiar story, mm-hmm. right? I think I said in the book, Deconverted, that it was like being in an oasis after being in the desert for such a long time. You feel like you're making up for lost time. You are ravenously consuming all this information, right? Did you do the books and the videos and everything that you could scramble to find kind of thing? I... <laughs> I, I watched a ton of YouTube. YouTube is a great rabbit hole to bring up more questions. I I, li- I listened to your book. I um, I consumed everything by uh, Barterman, and I watched all of the ACA shows. I just back to back. I had it in my headphones. I'm I'm a stay at home mom, so I was 
you know, doing my things, making lunch, had my headphone in just all the time for months. Um, <clears throat> I read quite a few books. Uh, I, I bought a bunch of um, new, like New Testament scholarship type books. And I wanted to know like, what are the scholars saying? Like I have a whole library now. It's of all these books and <laughs> like, yeah, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I, I was obsessed. I was completely obsessed with it for about six months. And then, and then some, when that something kind of broke through in August and I looked, I, I had that moment, I looked in the mirror and I, I was like, I think, I think I'm an atheist. <laughs> um, something just kind of, like you said, like the oasis, like something just went, <sighs> okay, now you can look at it cause it's interesting, but you don't have to, it, it was, the panic was gone. It's gone. August of which it's year? 2019. I mean, that's like freaking yesterday. Really. I know. I know. But for, like I, I, for me, it felt like it was five years worth of living in one year. Because um, so much was changing so fast for me. And I, I, I kind of, I, I do get, I, I love learning. I love reading. I love, like, I got my reading is sexy, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like I, I kind of exhaust an issue and then I move on to it. Um, so with each kind of question that I went through, I, I went until there was no more information to consume. And then I, and then, so I think that's kind of maybe why I feel quite grounded now. And I've kind of, I, ex- I went through the accelerated deconversion program. <laughs> You uh, raise up your mug that says reading is sexy. It reminds me, there's another poster. You remind me of it. It's got a light switch and it says completely obsessed. Yes. (laughs) Disinterested. You know, like you have an on and off. I'm a little bit the same way too. I think, you know, you dive in and you do it a thousand percent until you're kind of done, you know? Yep. But, um, I'm sure, you know, if you'd have really genuinely known the love of Jesus, I mean, no, no one who ever truly knew God could ever walk away from Christianity, right? I'm sure you've heard echoes of this from people who are concerned about your soul. Do you have to endure this stuff, Aaron? Yeah, I, I remember, like, I, I got on Twitter because I, I needed a, somewhere to scream into the void, and I, I really never expected anything from it. I just needed a place to kind of put my thoughts and, um, and I had watched a, a ton of people talk about, like, the online conversations between Christ, like theists and, and atheists and agnostics. And um, <clears throat> I remember thinking and maybe that was a bit of a caricature, like, no, Christ, I, Christians aren't going to be like that. Um, but yeah, I get, I get hit with it every day. Um, at first it kind of like kind of startled me. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I was on that side of the, of the conversation, but it didn't take very long for me to see the patterns. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's, it's the same thing every time. And, and now I actually kind of, I, I like engaging with the conversations. I like having, I try to have good, respectful kind of dialogue. I, online, I, I enjoy it now. I, I enjoy having the conversations with these people. How about and a I, conversation with mom and dad? Has that happened yet? Um, so I posted a couple of weeks ago that I accidentally outed myself. And so I, I hadn't really spoken to them, but I think they knew something was up. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to my dad, and my my dad is in that camp where he like he he thinks he thinks Bill Gates is the Antichrist. He thinks that this is the. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, like with with the COVID thing? Like he created the uh, COVID nineteen so he could sell us the the vaccine kind of conspiracy or vaccine is the mark of the beast. And if he comes up, he made a statement like he, if he, if the vaccine comes from Bill Gates, he's not getting it. And I, I'm thinking, I'm sitting here like, so I have an autoimmune disorder. I'm high risk. I have only been out of the house twice since March 8th. Um, oh. And I'm just thinking like, like what? <laughs> so he kind of was going on a bit of a rant and, and, and I, I guess I just lost my cool and I, not in any kind of aggressive way, but I, I pushed back a little bit and that kind of, we ended up having kind of a one hour conversation and it was, um, on Twitter. No, just over like, oh, video. okay. Okay. <laughs> and I was going to say, you know, Twitter is not exactly the oh. best forum for productive discourse. So. No, we were, we were ch- it was on mother's day. We were chatting, I was, you know, saying happy mother's day to my mom. My mom was there and, 
uh, yeah, I basically outed myself as a major doubter and obviously um, struggling or whatever. Um, we'll see where it, where it goes from here. It was kind of interesting to see that how they both responded. My dad was very like, he's, he, he's very much sold on this whole, like this is the end times. And um, my mom is too, but she's also a little bit more, um, she knows me really well and she, she's like, Oh no, don't, don't push her. Don't push her. Everybody struggles. And so I'm pretty sure they think that I am going through a phase right now. And that clearly I've been hurt a lot in the church. They know I was hurt, um, in some, some different areas. They know I have health issues, so that might be hard for me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the, the can is open and we'll just see what comes up next. I think I feel like ready for it. It'll be okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm grieved a little bit because, you know, if they stumble upon this interview, yeah. I don't want to complicate your life. You know, I did. I, I, you know, what's funny about, I, I, I'm not very good with confrontation, like starting it, but I'm, I'm totally okay with like dealing with it when it comes. <laughs> so I think I'll be okay if they, I feel like if they were to watch an interview, it might give them a good opportunity to just listen to what I have to say without there being a back and forth. Um, and then they can come ask me questions later. So I, I, I have thought about this. Like I'm public I'm on Twitter. I've got my face out there. Um, right. I fully expect to be discovered and that's fine. I actually feel fine with it. You're ready. You've come to a point when you are ready for that to happen. When yeah, it happens. So. All right. Yeah. So I get all this, I get a, a lot of practice on Twitter. <laughs> right? Well, you know, if your mom and dad were watching right now and they were listening to, you know, a third party like me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they might be already praying for my immortal soul. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, I said to somebody else, you know, you didn't choose this, right? You didn't wake up one day and say, you know, I'd like to have some questions and doubts and I'd like to walk away <laughs> from something that, you know, once provided the foundation for pretty much everything I ever did. And, yeah. and become potentially ostracized from the people I love who won't understand, and, you know, these consequences are in, in front of you. And, and yet you felt compelled to move forward. And you did so because uh, you wanted to live an authentic and honest life, you know, not because you're trying to hurt anybody and not because you're in rebellion or you, you hate God. You know, you and I probably heard a lot of those types of things or, you know, I think, when they say, you know, something must have happened to you, like you were wounded. There are times, I think, when we come to a cage rattling moment and it helps us to sort of stop and look around. I used to discount that, you know, but now I think, you know, it's, it's okay to acknowledge just something happened, whatever it was. And I just, it caused me to stop and the blinders came off and I gave myself permission to go down that road. So anyway, I, I guess if they were watching now, I would just try to encourage them to realize that, you know, it, I don't think you really choose what you believe. Like you could admit outright, overtly, hey, I still believe in God, but in your heart, it wouldn't be honest. It wouldn't be an honest approach. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that will be probably one of the hardest parts is to, to talk to them about it is because they, they absolutely think it's, it's a choice and they believe... Um, part of their part of their whole system is like you're you're believing or you're su you're suppressing or you're 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 walking in the light or you're walking in the darkness. Like there's there's a lot of this spiritual warfare kind of stuff going on. So I for them I I, I think it's going to be tricky trying to get them to see it from my perspective. Um, and that yeah I didn't. I didn't go into this be choosing like, oh, I'm, this, this is too confusing. I want out. <laughs> that wasn't it. It was, this is confusing. I need to know what's going on. And, it, and from there, I, each step of the way, I, it was, it was hard. I didn't want to go out. I, I kind of fought to stay in it. That's kind of, I felt like I was kind of trying to claw my way in back into my faith because I could recognize that I was losing it um, until I finally reached that moment where I was like, it, it's okay. Mom, Dad, she's still Aaron. I am she's still me. Still Aaron. She's yeah. still a, the good person she always was, maybe even better because she's trying to be honest with herself and everybody else. That's actually part of what I'm looking forward to and maybe the reason why I haven't had like a, a coming out statement is I, I sort of see the value in just keep continuing to be you and then when it comes up, I can, I can be like, you, 
you, I have still been me this whole time, but you didn't even know that I wasn't a, a, a Christian anymore, that I wasn't a believer anymore. And, but you can see that um, I'm, I haven't gone down this crazy trail of my life isn't just, you know, imploding or anything like that. Um, I think that, I think that will be good um, kind of icebreaker <laughs> into these conversations with them. But So, I mean, you were married to your husband of 10 years long before you extricated yourself. How's he doing with all this? He, he's doing good now. Um, I, I try not to talk too much about him online, but at the same time, it's important. A lot of people, that's probably not the number one d- question I get is, well, where's your husband at? Like, where, what's he doing? And he, he used to be a pastor. He used to be a youth pastor. <laughs> um, I will just say that he, he, it was hard. Being a youth pastor was hard. He got burned out like pretty, like I think he did it for about seven or eight years and then he just needed a break from it. And that's kind of when we got together. Um, so when I first started going through these questions, I, I shot a lot of arrows in his direction because I'm like, you're the one with the theology degree. I need the answers because this is confusing. And, and I, I definitely at first kind of burned a little bit of that, <laughs> burned that bridge for, for a moment because I was, I, I, it was chaos. And I was asking, I wanted him again to kind of fix it for me. And, and then I kind of realized that that wasn't helpful. And then um, kind of went in, into myself and figured it out for myself. And then when I emerged, I, I came and I said, like, I'm so, I'm so sorry for the anger moments. I think everybody has that anger moment when they're first coming out of it. Um, yeah. And so since then, it's been great. Uh, we have really, really good conversations. Um, there's a lot of, there's a bit of, kind of a sigh of relief in our home. Um, Cause now this pressure that what, what we need to be, um, ch- you know, that church going family and kind of keeping up with the Christian Joneses, like it's, there's just a, everything's calmer. It's like, there's the pressures off now. And so we've been noticing that a lot uh, lately and I don't know where he, he is really. I don't know, but he's okay with where I am. You see each other as people first, not as labels, denominations, brands, whatever. Yeah. And that was a big thing for him was, you know, he's, he's, he knows, he sees my Twitter, he's read my Twitter. And um, I had mentioned a couple times there, like how something shifted for me when I, when I left, when I had truly left and I looked at my husband and I'm like, Oh, he's, he's not a, my spiritual leader. He's, he's another human. <laughs> and like, Oh my gosh, like we, we are, doing this life together and like we both mess up and like so something changed even with the way I saw him and 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 our relationship has been better um there's so much more patience and and understanding and empathy kind of evolving now with us because there's this unspoken pressure we've and we've talked about this this unspoken pressure that he needed to be this leader this kind of almost flawless person because he's that head of the family, even though we weren't like really super involved at the church, we still were going to church. It's a, it's an unspoken thing. So I think that that patriarchal um, system is, is, I, we talked about how it's harmful for both people. What's your end zone. I mean, with the Twitter, is it targeted to achieve something specific, you know, cause I'd like to send people to your Twitter. I mean, would you like some more Twitter followers? Because I know people will respond to you and your story, but I mean, what do you want? What are you trying to do? Um, I think I, I, I want to share my story, uh, help give language to some of the things that I've gone through. I would like to kind of break some of the stereotypes that like, you know, um, people become atheists for this reason or that, that reason. Like I'm, I'm married. I'm a, I have a stay, I'm a stay at home mom. I've got kids. Like I am pretty normal. <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to just keep expanding and reaching more people and having really good conversations with people. I don't know where, um, I don't know where the end goal is yet. If I, if I wasn't quite busy with my kids, I think I'd like to do more stuff, more interviews, more, um, podcasts and things like that. I think I'd like to go in that direction. You want to help people. I do. Yeah, I do. I I get that. It's like one thing, one benefit from all the time we spent immersed in superstition 
is that we can speak to it and we can have compassion about it. And we can try to, it's like you were talking about your husband, how he burned out in the sort of as a youth pastor. And I know that a lot of people who are lifelong atheists will toss out, you know, oh, the pastors are all a bunch of corrupt or they're this or that. They're all a bunch. And the truth is you and I know that most people who do pastoral work are, they give of themselves so much that they do. They almost have nothing left for their at home families and they will burn out because they're on call 24 seven doing a job where, you know, they're not making all that much money. And, uh, you know, you really often they do it because they genuinely are passionate to do it. Was that the case with your husband? Oh, definitely. We, we've had this conversation at like, why, why did you go into youth, youth ministry? And, and still right now, he's like, I just, I really, really wanted to help these kids. At, he, the kids that were at, that didn't come from like a loving home and like um, kids at risk, kids, uh, youth at risk. And he just wanted, he wanted to be a mentor. He had that, he has a kind of a, a personality where he wants to kind of pull everybody in and put them under his wings. And so he's still doing it in a different way today. Like we have a, we own a business and he has, he has a lot of um, kind of young, young adult. We own an automotive shop. So he has a lot of young adult men coming in and and he's like the big brother he's like the ultimate big brother to these guys so he kind of jokes that he's he's like i still am a youth pastor i just don't talk about jesus anymore um yeah he's an encourager right he, he helps to motivate advocate for people and sort of shore them up and send them back into the game i mean that's awesome he just he got into it because he loves people he's a people person um he really wanted to help and and change somebody's life um yeah and then he he they're really hard on pastors in the ministry. They're, they, yeah. like you said, they, they spread them so thin. There's, it's unbelievable. Well, I, your voice is important. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk today. You are providing a window into a culture that's not often understood, often misrepresented. And it's a compassionate look at kind of what happened. Your mom and dad did what they did because they genuinely believed in heaven and hell. And they believed even to this day, they were doing the right thing, the moral thing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing there's, you don't, you're not bitter toward mom and dad. You don't hate them for what they did. You know, uh, is that when accurate? I, when I first started coming out of this, so last kind of spring, summer, um, there was some anger there. I, I was, I was mad. I was mad at the things that I was taught and, and could, how they've affected me throughout my life. But it wasn't a very long time that I was mad at my parents because very quickly I realized that exactly what you said, that they, they believe it to their core. They believe it so strongly that there's, I can't be mad at them because I, there was no intentional deception there. There was no, um, they weren't trying to do anything harmful. They weren't trying to expose me to harmful um, beliefs. They just believe it. Now, it, to be clear, it's okay to be angry about the bad ideas in play yeah. and the fact that people like your mom and dad are married to some pretty bad ideas. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, so it's, I'm not saying that anger is not justified, but it's important that we see many of the people who teach these things to their kids. The reason they do so is not because they're motivated to be awful people. They genuinely sort of have been indoctrinated into believing yeah. that this is the right thing to do, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so the anger is still there, but it's not towards my parents anymore. It's towards the system. It's towards the the teachings, the book, the doctrine itself. That's what I see now is like the truly harmful part. The it's not the people in it that are stuck. Well, it can be the people in it, yeah, but yeah, my case, it wasn't my parents. Um, it, it's the system itself. Aaron, I think a lot of what's going to change the world is the stories of people. I, you know, sharing our stories, telling our stories, reminding people there are errands right now who are watching this broadcast, right? Except they are now where you were a few years ago and they're looking around going, what the hell? And what happens next? And they probably hear what you're saying and they just, you know, get goosebumps and they think it's like she's looking in my windows and and then that encourages them to, you know, if Aaron was able to take the journey and come out the other side, maybe I can as well. And that's one of the things I wanted this conversation to accomplish. You know, your story is one that encourages and inspires me. It just, it just honestly, it just makes me happy. You know, you're free. It just makes me smile. So, good for you. 
those people who are who are hearing it and they're like, oh, something feels familiar about this. Like those are the people that I want to like. I want to talk to you. I want to. I want to help you. Help you out that last step of the way. Like there's, it's so hard that last that last nudge <laughs> to look yourself in the mirror and say like, I don't believe this. Um, and so I think those are the people that I'm the most interested in. I mean, if you were to talk to him directly right now, like you're looking right into the eyes of another Aaron or Bob, Susan, I mean, whoever's going through the journey, what do, what do you say? I would just encourage them to be brave, be brave enough to keep going. Um, something about the, everything that you've gone through up to this point, it was you, it was, you were strong enough to get through everything up to this point and you're strong enough to face those, those doubts, face those last questions that you have and just go for it. And there's people on the other side. You, you're, you, there's some things that will, you'll lose some communities, like they're going to church, you might lose some comfort items, but there's, there, there's better things on the other side. There's better communities more compassion, um, more understanding, and way more opportunities for growth because you're not going to be stunted by this harmful system anymore. Uh, that's it, right? That's what I should title the show. There are better things on the other side. That's uh, just the truth of it. Aaron, I'm going to send a whole bunch of people to your Twitter page. So get ready. It's uh, Aaron X, X, G, N, uh, No, I'll just put it, I'll put it in the description box and on the screen, but Aaron, the ex-Christian, and I totally get what you're about. And all my best to you and your husband. Be safe out there and let's cross paths and talk again soon, okay? I love that. Thank you so much.